because I feel like I have a lot more to lose, but I think that's my ego talking. Well, let's talk about this. Okay. Let's talk about well, this. Well, we're live. So this okay. is the bonus section with Jeff McBride. <laughs> and, uh, we're Magic competition. We're going to be talking about competitions. Well, you were just saying that uh, you're con contemplating going back into competitions? I've, you know, I've thought about it a lot, and I don't want... Yeah, there's been a hesitation. I understand this. There is a lot of good reasons to enter competitions. It's hard to compare art. And I understand that, but competitions do give people a goal. Competitions do give uh, a, a, a platform to be viewed by the greater world, maybe agents, bookers, other people. Um, uh, a lot of magicians, many magicians, have made a big splash by winning national competitions and international competition. It is a pipeline into the real world. I know some magicians will say, oh, I don't do, you know, competitions. I work for the real world. Well, guess what? The people that love magic the most are magicians. Right. And there's a huge market internationally for magicians, you know, events and conferences and, and all different types of conventions. And, um, uh, you know, Las Vegas is, is full of magic conventions and magic events. And they're, they're populated by magicians. So, yes, it sets a deadline. It will raise your bar. You'll, you'll be forced to work with mentors and coaches and designers if you're serious about doing it. And uh, it doesn't matter if you win. Sometimes the acts that get seen get the work over acts that, um, that uh, win the prizes. That totally happened to me. Yeah, what happened? Well, I, I, we mentioned in your lecture how there was a little bit of shady, something happened, and it was... Ooh. and uh, Controversy at a magic scandalous. Yeah. So anyway, I was supposed to be at a certain point, and a judge came out to me later, explained everything, and, and we've had that conversation several, several times since then. But the beauty of it was I got booked in China after that. I got booked on Murray Hatfield's tour when I was 19 years old, and I got a lot of work out of losing. You, you lost the battle but won the war. I, really, truly. Yeah, that, that, that does happen. And uh, another reason to enter a magic competition is because it's great publicity for you. How so? Now, even if you don't win, you're still in the media eye. There was a lot of reservation. AGT is a magic competition. I mean, it's a competition. Yeah. And a lot of people were very skittish the first couple of years because they were so brutal on the magicians. They were just yeah. brutal. They were hard on the magicians. And then they realized that magicians weren't going to come on. Right. Because it would impact, it was too damaging to their career. However, now magicians come on and they'll go on for one or two appearances. And they might not make, but those two appearances can make them a star that can get them on the map. You might never see it. They might not go to the finals, but one or two appearances with that big AGT behind them and that big stage and those clips go out there and, wow, all of a sudden these people are on our radar, aren't they? Yeah. That they who knew from Smoothini, the ghetto Houdini? Right. Right? He's a Las Vegas act. He works out at Wonderground, but now the world knows this guy and he's kind of like a, a you know, an underdog hero, Smoothini, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, Matt Franco, he had a very successful career. He could have lost. He could have got second place. Um, the clairvoyants didn't win, but now they're working, working, working. Yeah. Did it damage their career that they didn't win? No, it launched them into the hyperspace. Yeah. Um, I just entered a magic competition. Uh, it's called Fool Us. Right. And that's a live or die sort of situation. Yeah. But Penn and Teller have designed a show, as the producer said before the show, that is designed by magicians for magicians. And they want to make everybody look really good. They don't want to hatchet job people because if they do, the tide is turned, especially on television magic competitions. They know they're not going to get people. Right. Or they're not going to get good people. They'll get daring bad people is what they'll get. So competitions have changed in the media and... Um, uh, in in the world of magic, in the magic community. If you enter a competition, make sure it's an act that you want to do. <laughs> because a lot of people design magic acts that are totally impractical to travel. Right. And I've seen wonderful magic acts and magic competitions that are impossible to book. 
because of the size of their equipment. Mm. There's kind of a, if you're a competition act, there's kind of a scalability to it. Because if what happens is you win a magic competition, then you kind of go on this circuit of yeah. all the conventions. And if the can conventions can't get your doves, you, they are quick enough, then you have to use borrowed doves and learn all of the, uh, the, the, the secrets of getting doves internationally and all the people for the doves. And the, I am an the, expert on borrowing doves, by the way, so if anybody wants tips. <laughs> yeah, flyers? <laughs> How about flyers? Well, and that's part of putting your act together, right? Is yeah. you're going to win, don't use flyers. That's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. You have to act, make sure it's an act that you want to do. Um, and sometimes you get branded with that act. Yeah. And it's hard to stretch out from that. So make sure it's an act that you want to do. Now, did you win magic competitions? I did win some. Which ones? Uh, PCAM. PCAM. I, I won the, the gold at the Pro Challenge. Or is it Pro Challenge? Yeah, Pro Challenge. And mm -hmm. the uh, first place in the juniors the year before. Mm -hmm. Now, I've been to a lot of magic competitions, and I don't like judging because I have so many students. I yeah. don't like judging. But I have judged some events uh, with FISM rules, like in Asia and in Russia with Eric Eswin and Domenico Dante and those, those FISM judges. And they're looking for very specific things. They're looking, you know, a, a lot of the judges are looking for a person that can really represent magic. And here's the thing. Sometimes the person is a great act, but they're not articulate and well-spoken. And they find this out by talking to them between the rounds of the competition. And they'll say, did you hear this guy talk? How is he going to represent us in the media? Look at this guy yeah. or gal. So sometimes it's not what you do on stage. It's what you can do for magic offstage that is very important because they're electing a spokesperson. FISM's mm -hmm. imprimatur is on it. So you could do the wildest, weirdest show that shocks them, but they might not want Marilyn Manson representing you know, FISM because right. of the kind of stature of FISM or their, their, their pub public persona profile. You know, so there's a lot going on kind of on and off stage. It's not just strictly done on points. If it can be, you, you know, Jack Goldfinger is probably the person that gets more videotapes than any person in the world. Why is this? At the Because he books the Magic Castle. Now, <clears throat> Magic Castle is kind of a magic competition because you have to be, you have to win getting in. You right. have to win the audition. So you have to be unique. You have to surprise the people. You have to surprise the magicians. If you can fool magicians, great. Or you could say, oh, I'm not gonna fool magicians. I'm just, it's really important to fool magicians because if you can fool magicians, you can fool the lay audience. And if you can fool magicians, you're gonna get better work. Like at the Magic Castle is a great place to work. Right. It is one of the most glamorous places in the world to work. And it is, the Larson family has produced more magic shows than any family or people in the history of planet Earth. They have been producing multiple rooms seven nights a week for 50 years. They have produced more magic. They have seen more magic and it's harder to get into that room. Who's gonna get into that room? Award-winning magicians that fool magicians are gonna get that. You get to showcase at the Hollywood Magic Castle, you might have a shot of getting those television and uh, other producers in to see you at the most glamorous upscale private club in the world. Thank you, fool magicians. Surprise them. Have a great character, original material, and make sure it's an act that's practical to travel. It's great tips. Mm. Well, for practical to travel, let's dive into that a little bit. On your main lecture, you talk about packing small, playing anywhere. Yep. Maybe let's go a little bit more in the competition realm of what things make it impractical versus practical to travel. You know, okay, practical. What used to be practical is no longer practical. I used to be able to travel with flash powder. After 9-11, yeah. no. I can't travel with flash powder. I can't fly with any sort of things that are wicked. 
or have had petrol or any sort of combustible white gas on them. Yeah. Torch fluid. I mean, they, they just, no, no torches, no, no, nothing that has ever touched a flammable net anything. So if you have torches, so fire is, a, it's, they've taken fire away from us. In magic competitions, they have taken confetti away from us. What are we left with? They've taken fire, they've taken air. Uh, what's next? We can't spill water, right? We can't drop anything on stage. Well, I have a problem with acts that drop all of their props on stage. Like, here are all my CDs. Look, I throw them on the floor. What does this say about society? Right. right. <laughs> Look, I have new stuff. It's old stuff. New stuff. Old stuff. Garbage. 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 Yeah. I produce garbage. I produce the stuff to throw it on the floor. Right. Okay. <laughs> That's why I have a little container on stage. I throw my cards in, and then I throw them as souvenirs. So, um, Magic competitions are a great way to show the world who you are. And I think magic competitions made a great uh, difference in your career, didn't they? Huge difference. And you're thinking about going back and doing America's Got Talent, or what are you doing? Or I'm, the I'm, national, I'm, you're gonna do America's Got Talent? Yo, know, I'm thinking I'm thinking of some different competitions. Uh-huh. I'll leave that for off camera. We'll have a conversation. I'll okay. get some coaching. It's gonna be a be surprise. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I've coached a lot of champions. I've coached uh, you know, Aaron Crow, who is a FISM winner with a yeah. silent, he won mentalism. Oh, wow. With a silent act. <laughs> I mean, music driven, music driven act. And, um, you know, Michael Trix, who you had on, mm -hmm. you know, he's a diamond in the rough. He came in here, you know, and now he's working all the time and he was winning magic competitions and he got, he got China gig from winning magic competitions. He's yeah. going back to China. You go to, you get win a magic competition and go to China they see you, the agents see you, and the, you go to Happy Valley, and there's eight Happy Valley theme parks that are Disneyland, and they all have magic shows with multiple magicians. So again, if you say that, oh, it's not a real career move, you can spend your life just rotating between the, the, the eight Happy Valley theme parks. Right. Doing a manip act, an escape act, a talking show if you speak Chinese, or you can do a Grand Illusion show. We do our Grand Illusion show there. So, you know, competitions really are a pipeline into a career, you know, sure. if you have the right act. But you gotta do something different. You gotta surprise us. You know, it's gotta be different. It can't be the same old thing. So what are you gonna do new? You had a whole new thing that you t took the bird act and made it super contemporary, right? Uh, yeah, you know, and I added a few Minor touches, I had all short sleeves, everything. I mm -hmm. had no tails, which, you know, some, not that that's the first person to do it, but the style that I did it and the combination of, uh, mm -hmm. of methods made it mm -hmm. made it practical mm -hmm. um, for competitions. Mm -hmm. And are you going to be doing a bird act in the competitions? Uh, we'll talk. We'll talk. <laughs> yeah. I can't reveal it all here. Okay, well, okay. I've coached a lot of award-winning acts. Because I've been in the audience, I've been on the stage, I know what it takes to engage a magic judge, I know what they're looking for, because I've been on both sides of it. Yeah. I've been the coach, I've been the performer, I've been the competitor, I've been the, you know, everywhere, yeah. all different parts of it. And if you want to hear what winners have to say, on our website, on, we have a mcbridemagic.com slash winners circle. McBrideMagic.com, Winner's Circle. And it's all of our champion magicians, men and women, young and old, that have entered magic competitions and won and their stories on what it took. So if you really are interested in learning about what it takes to be a winning competition act from the winner and what they did, all of our winner, you know, p people like, like I say, like, like Aaron Crow, like Romany, who was the first woman to win the Magic Circle Magician of the Year, Matthew Wright, Magician of the Year, and got second place under Jan Frisch at FISM, mm. you know, by like two points, and he'll tell you why. And, it, and the list goes on and on and on with all these different competitors giving you the, the real experience on what it takes to win a Magic competition. So go there and check it out if you're serious um, you know, you can always contact me. You can send me your videotape and I'll review your videotape and I'll give you honest notes face to face and tell you what I think you need to change or tweak or add to make it a winning performance.
And for the new generation that has no idea what a videotape is, <laughs> just send a YouTube link, right? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Uh, this is something I thought about a lot in, in with Michael Trix. So he came out, he lectured, and he's a working pro making six figures a year. Uh, and I, and he says, oh, I get coaches from Jeff, coaching from Jeff. I was on with him today. Yeah. All right. And, and so what, what I realized was everybody that is doing great, no matter what level, they always have a coach. And I'm not saying this only to promote your class because every teacher and student has to have the relationship that works properly. Hopefully mm -hmm. that's with you. Oh, there's bad not, students. Maybe somebody else. Yeah. But it, they're not, they're, they might be bad for me and I might give them to a person that's perfect for them. Exactly. That would happen, you know, all the time, but they're, they're not right for me. They're right for somebody else. Can you? Because I don't have the skill set to satisfy their needs. Yeah. I know if a, if a, if a person is wanting to learn riffle stack run-ups, I'm going to send them to Jason England. Yeah, yeah, that's who I'm going to send them to. If a person wants to work on grand illusions, I'm going to send them to one of our other teachers, like Greg Gleason, who's you know got it all. Yeah. If there's somebody that's working on escapes, I'm going to send them to one of our escape masters. So every coach has a different skill set. Uh, mine is really music driven, stage magic, yeah. and formal close up theater. But then to expand on that. What Vegas headliners in the last decade in Magic have still, while headlining, had coaches and mentors still guiding them? Oh, well, let's look at Johnny Thompson, who coached uh, Lance Burton his entire life. Um, Lance, uh, Lance is now retired, but still retains uh, uh, Johnny as, as a consultant. Johnny Thompson is also consultant to Penn and Teller, right? Uh, Penn and Teller, Teller's called me in to help him on some things, but their main, you know, man, their main magic coach director is uh, Johnny Thompson. So people have different uh, s styles of, of mentorship. You know, um, uh, Matt Franco, I go in to help Matt. Matt is still teachable. He's still learning. He's still growing. Um, so... Um, I guess Chris Angel had, um, you know, the the Le Cirque directors work with him to to help him with 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 his show. Um, just trying to think of other people. David Goldrake is on the strip right now down at the Golden Nugget, and he's got a, a great director and a great team, including a visual artist named uh, Dirk DeClou, which directed all of his um, uh, kind of traveling mat work and all the projection mapping. Yeah. Uh, so pretty much where I was trying to go with this, you've hit every single person that is big is still having coaches help and guide them. Almost every person, and they, most most they and they might have multiple coaches. Yeah, because like if you if you if you're doing a show, you need somebody that's a music designer. You need somebody that's a choreographer. You need a lighting designer. And these are all these are coaches. Yeah. You're hiring them, but they're the ones that are shaping your look and feel on stage. You're going to work with a fashion consultant. You're going to work with your your media team, your social media team, and your and your uh, public relations firm. They're all part of, and they all have to be working together. And that's part of having a great team. And if there's anything that has contributed to my success, is I have a great manager. I've had great mentors in my life. I have a great support system with not only my touring show and uh, you know, uh, but also the Magic School, also Wonderground. So I have all these different things. A Mystery School Monday, which is every Monday, which is a one-hour broadcast every Monday. So I have all of these different team members connecting. And one of the things that we do is every week our entire team meets Monday morning at ten o'clock online in either a Skype, uh, a group Skype or a FaceTime Hangout or wh whatever platform is working for everybody right. that day because it's changes. Yeah. Sometimes this isn't working, so we all go over here. But our entire team meets with all the little, and we have at least a one hour meeting. So we're all on the same page, all of the touring people, all of our team in China, all of the school people. So we're all going over the projects. Okay, you talk to so and so about that project. Boom, 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 and we have different. We take turns uh, guiding the meeting, kind of chairing the meeting, and everybody's in that meeting every Monday. I mean, occasionally one or two people will be out of the meeting, but they'll be in the next one. So having a great team, meeting them face to face, and really giving them appreciation, praise, and gratitude.
I mean, I think it's really important to, that it's the people don't just work for money. Yeah. You know, they work to be a part of something greater. They people support what they help create. There it is again. Awesome. Make sure you guys check out Jeff's entire lecture right here on the Magic Master Summit.